comadres. Oh, Welcome to the fourth episode of Comadreando. I'm your host, Marcy. And we have an amazing guest today, my personal comadre, Sandy. And I'm going to let her introduce herself. Who are you? Hey, comadre. Hi, comadres and compadres. <laughs> I'm Sandy, also known as Arenosa, because that means Sandy in Spanish, if you translate it. And um, I am Marcy's comadre. Yay! Yay! <laughs> I'm bringing all my girls. Um, so today's topic is a very interesting one, and it's a little controversial. Um, and it's regarding the female archetypes. So the reason why the topic came up is I get a lot of questions from moms and comadres alike asking how I make time to have balance, being a mom, a professional, dating hobbies and self-care. And who better than the person I look up to who I'm like, what would Sandy do um, to share this topic with? That's funny because first of all, I want your audience to know that we didn't even rehearse this. I don't even know the questions you're going to ask. And um, <laughs> and I didn't even know that that was the topic. I was under the impression that we were going to talk about like how to balance, blah, blah, blah. But I didn't know that was like the, 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 the title. Um, first, I want to tell you that um, thank you so much for saying that and that the admiration is mutual. And, um, and second, um, what was the question? <laughs> well, we're 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 gonna start with the question. So oh, okay. how how do you, you do it? How <laughs> no, yeah. So how do you do it? How do you balance um, all these hats that we wear as women and still make time for yourself so that you don't feel basically drained at the end of the day? So I am a mom of three. I uh, am a registered nurse uh, by trade, and I also do styling at the side. I do product placement for um, liquor, um, Ciroc and De Leon for uh, a binder agency and comb enterprises. And um, I just, I, I do it all, right? Um, I have a lot of, I wear a lot of belts and I carry a lot of keys like a janitor. However, what I find that works for me is that it's been in stages. So life as a mom, when they're newborn, is very different when they're toddlers, right? And the same when they're teenagers. And then like me, I have young adults. I have a 23-year-old son. I have an 18-year-old daughter and a 13-year-old son and my dog. So um, for me... When they were younger, I was able to manage it like a, like a schedule. I had a calendar. And I remember when I first had my the two oldest, my life was overwhelming because I had two kids. And it was just like, that's all I said to everyone. I have two kids. I have two kids. Like, I can't do this. I have two kids. I have two. It was like a lot. So when the third was coming, I, I put out a calendar in the, in the kitchen, literally a, a big ass calendar that I used to make myself because back then, um, I don't think we even had target like, ah, uh, I don't remember 23 years ago. Definitely so not. I don't, yeah. So I remember I made it myself and what I did was that I used to have the days divided and I would let them know, like, listen, Mondays is for Alan. That's the oldest, right? I'm just giving you an example. Tuesdays is for Kylie. That meant that they had my undivided attention and we did whatever they wanted to do. Wednesdays were for mommy. That meant that um, when I wanted to do my nails, for example, or anything like even even go to, I remember we had a Kmart, even go to Kmart, they had to come with me and they had to behave because it was mommy's day. Yeah. Um, and then Thursdays were for the youngest. So that meant that we went to the library. We did baby stuff, right? Toddler shit. And then Fridays was for home. We needed to do things for the house, which meant everyone has a chore. So that's how I divided my time when I was, when they were little, but as they got older and they had their own activities and, um, life adds on, especially as someone that, 
um, my create, I have a creative outlet. I do other things. I have a podcast. How can I not say that? Um, um, yes. as they're older, um, and I have things to do that entail me, like I'm single. So that entails, I'm going to date someone, right? Eventually. Um, I, I have to make a commitment to myself, literally get up and, and put it in, in a journal or put it in somewhere, write it so I can see it, that I have to make a commitment for myself, whether it's every day, um, 45 minutes, whether to move, you know, exercise, walk outside or meditate, whatever it is, I know that I have a commitment to myself and then everyone around me needs to respect that and they understand that at this point they all do like right now i'm recording and i told my son like i'm gonna be recording don't speak loud right <laughs> and and, and uh -huh. don't come and interrupt me and pick up my phone calls and and let them know that i'm recording and yes. that's they're used to it already they're done they're like and the way that you respect yourself and the boundaries that you put for yourself and the commitment that you make to yourself for yourself Others um, sometimes have an issue with it at the beginning, but then they roll with it. And then they start asking you, how did you do that? And you start giving tips and they start doing it because you are a person, right? You are human. You're just not mom. And that's, that's the mistake that culturally, um, not a mistake, but culturally, that's something that we learned that motherhood is so hard, um, is about sacrifices. You never, yes. you sacrifice yourself and you never, ever, ever, God forbid, you know, even for your, a gift, like you ask your mom, what do you want? And they don't even know. Uh -huh. I could tell you what the fuck I want. <laughs> I'll give you a list. <laughs> right. Is this image of la madre abnegada, you know, like mm -hmm. sufriendo, mm -hmm. sacrificándose por sus hijos. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that that is not something that we do culturally. Like, you know, you try to go above and beyond for your children. Pero um, I feel like the only way to be a really good mom is to make time for yourself and to set those boundaries. Because a lot of the time, you know, I cannot mom right if I don't make time for myself. Of course. And that is a sacrifice. You know how hard it is at the beginning to even make that commitment to yourself? That's a sacrifice. You yes. know how hard it is for me? I tell people, I don't watch TV and everybody gets very surprised. And people think it's, oh, because I'm reading a book. It's not that. It's not that. It's that when they were younger, I didn't watch TV. I could not watch TV for two hours. I had shit to do. So I got so used to not watching TV because I was always doing something for the kids. So, yes. or for, or for the household. And I was a married woman for 20 years. You understand? And I, and I, I've been a registered nurse since a thousand years ago, since mm -hmm. um, 2003. So all my time has been working, going to school, being a mom. I had other things. I couldn't watch TV. I got used to not watching TV. So now when I am integrating, like I just started like a week ago, just watching certain things on HBO Max or like a Netflix series. I, I just watched the Luis Miguel series. And that's been a sacrifice for me because I have to sit and watch TV. That's self-sacrificing because when you are used to on the move, you got to you got is a reminder. And for me, like you said, um, in order for me to be a happy person first and then a good mom uh, to the best of my abilities, I have to be happy and I have to be good to me. If you're mean to yourself or if you don't care about yourself or you don't have a commitment to yourself, how, how, how can you? Yes. Everything that a kid will tell you will, will irritate you. You know how much they talk? Yeah. You have to listen. I mean, I know I'm a teacher. Exactly. <laughs> I don't even know how you do that. Honestly. <laughs> like, that's crazy right there. Let me tell you, I, I wasn't always Headache. like this, though. No, a lot. it's a lot. It's a lot. Um, I wasn't always like this, so I used to be kind of like, you know, taking 
that uh, Madre Abnegada role mm -hmm. from seeing my mother, sure. sacrificing, sacrificing, sacrificing. Mm -hmm. And they take all the pride time. in that. They oh, yeah. And, and, and if that makes you feel good, but I know mm -hmm. that I cannot be a good mom to my kid un unless I meet my own needs first. Right. And, you know, yes, I can't take care of my child and I go above and beyond. But oh, there's moments that, yes, I do go on a date. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do take myself out to dinner. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do go to the movies by myself. You know, things that make me happy mm -hmm. to be able to, you know, you can't, what is it? What is it that people say? You can't pour from an empty cup. Mm -mm. So you have to have, make time for yourself to fill that cup because mm -hmm. there's no way that you can, you know, be the right exactly like make yourself happy first before you're able to be a good mother mm -hmm. you know even if it's something tan sencillo like going to get my eyebrows done that going to get my nails time. done hello your time. and and i i i'm like it couldn't be me and the thing Honestly. is that like i said before it's about stages you see like right now when when they were younger those were the things that i used to take time for like that was my time the nails or maybe my eyebrows or whatever. That was my time. However, as they get older, um, my time changes, right? And also my lifestyle has changed because from married to single, it has changed. So now my, my time ha is a little bit, um, I don't have to step away per se because um, I could do stuff here in the house and they're older and they, I don't have to like set anything up for them, whether it's food, clothing, whatever you do when they're little. Right. Um, so now I can do a lot of things here myself in my house. So for me, my time definitely is just disconnecting because what I do for a living in both situations, whether it's the creative side or the nursing part, it involves giving to others and being service to others. Um, so that would deplete my energy totally. If I wouldn't, if I can't disconnect and just align, reconnect to myself and have that time to myself. So that's my, my time now. However, when they were little, my time was to get out. I used to leave and do my eyebrows, whatever, like just do something. Now, Johnny me arreglo la ceja. Ya, yo me la quito yo misma y yo me la coloreo. Like, I don't do none of that anymore. But I used to. <laughs> That's funny because I you said that. I'm like, yeah, I used to do that. Like, I used to just step out just to do that because that was my time. Claro. It, uh, it's just, you know, on the go, like being on the go constantly mm -hmm. um, has effects on people. So I, the, the next question I had is, um, why is it important to have a work-life balance? Why, why do you feel it's important? Well, for me, it's important because um, the type of work that I do, I'm in the world of service. Um, I service in, my, in the nursing career and I service um, in my creative side. Um, therefore, I have to have balance. I wouldn't be able to receive um, anyone's issues, whether it's spiritually or physically or emotionally, I wouldn't be able to hold space for them because I would probably be, um, not even, um, aware enough to, to make any recommendations or to, um, even be a good listener. Yes. I would probably be thinking about the shit that I'm not doing or the things that I'm doing and all over the place um, instead of being centered in the now and just concentrating when I'm a nurse, I'm a nurse. And where the patient is um, having trouble, I can be compassionate or I can... Um, right now, my line of work is not so much of patient care when it comes to nursing, it's more like be the beauty and wellness, um, the beauty and wellness industry. But that's even more when when you come to think about it, because the person looks good like you and I, like they're not sick. 
but okay. they come to get better, right? Or more beautiful. Yes. Right? They're beautiful, but they came to, you know, get that service to look even better, that Botox or whatever it is, right? That IV uh -huh. with vitamins and whatever. So if I don't take care of myself, I can't present to you, look, you do this vitamin and you're going to feel good because this is what uh -huh. I do. I don't look like it. I sure don't fucking look like it, right? It's it's just like no, that's one, two, and um, if if I'm not if I'm not present where I can listen to your concerns, this is Sandy. This is how I feel, and this is how I think I look when I see myself in the mirror. I need this um I don't know collagen or Botox or whatever um. For me, I feel like if I'm not happy doing that and in the moment and with the person and really understanding how they feel um, because I'm so worried or because I'm so into, I'm not being balanced. I'm more like maybe at home thinking about the kids or what, whatever your brain does, then mm -hmm. it's a disservice to the client. And the same thing in, in the other stuff that I do. Um, as a stylist, if you come over or if I come over to you and I'm helping you put a mood board together of the season, like for the fall or whatever, if I'm not in there in the moment with that energy, it's going to transfer into what I'm giving you yep. there. And I know that, and I know that because not because I haven't been there. It's because I'm always there. I'm always like in that energy. And like, there's, it's always a hit. Not for nothing, but there's, it's always a hit because I'm in that moment. Like, and you're going to feel it when I take out those, those clothes and put them together for you and, and tell you how you're going to put them and you know, how one thing could elevate the other. And I'm talking to you, you get motivated. I'm telling you, you'll be like, yo, I'm gonna wear that shit tomorrow. I'm gonna put it like this. I'm gonna do that. And we get into it together is a frequency. Claro. It's a frequency. It's an energy It's a momentum. So that's why you have to have balance. And when I come home, I leave everything. All that is out the door. When I'm home, I, I told you, I, I texted you today and I was like, yo, I was busy. I'm, I'm going to record with you, but I'm going to record at a certain time because I want to cook, but I want to cook. I don't want to think uh -huh. that I have to do recording, that I'm running uh -huh. late. None of that. It's a disservice to you, Marcy. Yeah. And to myself, because we want to do this, right? We want to have yeah. a conversation and we want to be in the moment. I don't want to think about that I had to do the dishes or que no me quedó bien la carne porque estaba en un mm -hmm. rápido. No, yo me cociné mi carne, puse mi salsa. You know, um, I, I chopped the onions. I did everything that I had to do. I had dinner with my son because nada más no quedó yo y mi hijo, el chiquito ahora. La niña está mm -hmm. en la universidad y el grande no, no vive conmigo. So it's him and I. We ate. Después que yo terminé, fui a yo hasta, hasta que me um, sage antes de empezar. Me puse mi pintalabio, todo mi cosa. Because, like I said, everything is balanced and just slowing down. Yes. I feel like uh, eso, eso, you touched on a very important um, point, which is being present, right? How important it is to be present. Like, do everything con gusto. O sea, take your time. There's no reason to be rushing, you know? And um, I feel like that you, 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 you really, like, your energy, you can tell. Like, the way that you are, que tú está bien calmada, like, the way that the conversation is flowing, is important to be present in the moment. People are always, like, on this go, go, go thing. And yes, we have a lot of things to do, pero también, like you said, it's a disservice. If we don't honor, you know, the time that we're dedicating to do certain things, it, it, it shows. Right. Y tú sabes que, que I was thinking when you said that, that is also setting you up for failure. When claro. I feel that if I'm, I have to be honest with myself and I have to, mm -hmm. I, and it's hard. To be like, wait, uh -huh. wait, before I 
try to do all of that. Let me just hit Marcy up because it's not it's not that serious. It is serious, uh-huh. but it's not that serious. We can push it. We can push it to another time so we can do this right. And I'm not claro. rushing into anything and feeling resentful. Like I have to do something. Conchole, porque uh-huh. Marcy me preguntó sabiendo que yo estoy busy. Esto que lo, you know, because that's what happens. Uh-huh. That's what happens. But that's a conscientious decision. That's you stopping and looking as an outsider, like a third person to yourself and be like, yo, what are you doing here? All right, let's think about this. Let's call her. It's not that serious. Uh-huh. Let's call uh-huh. her and get this done. And that way you're in the moment and everything is all good. You get everything yes. done because time is time is um, essential, right? But at the same time, it's a constriction. Yes, I agree. If it makes any sense. You know, it does, definitely. Um, our next question mm-hmm. is, how does how does n- not being in balance um, reflect on the body? Because I know you're, you and I are like very spiritual people. So I know that stress can reflect on the body in a certain way. But like not being in balance, how does that usually reflect in people? Well, in so, general, um, as a nurse, and I have to study the systems, um, but I was a GI nurse, which is a gastroenterologist nurse for a long time, for more like, like more than 15 years. What I realized is that a lot of the diseases, like um, chronic inflammation of the colon, um, divert, not divert, diverticulitis, um, hold on, um, Crohn's disease, a lot of um, diseases like celiac disease. There was a lot of diseases, uh, um, irrit- irritable bowel syndrome, IBS. Uh, what we noticed was that if they, if the patient came just to um, get rid of the symptoms, then we were putting a band aid on the situation, but it was never cured. It was just Mm -hmm. a bandaid until the bandaid comes off again and then another bandaid. Um, and the bandaid was either medications or big interventions like an endoscopy, um, with, um, interventions inside. We did, I don't know, we even did Botox injections in people with, um, hyper, um, activity in the, in the stomach Mm because they had a lot of acid reflux. Mm-hmm. And we had to have the patient come every three months and get these injections inside the stomach. With that being said, what we started noticing is that certain people came for certain diseases, right? I'm going to give you an example. People that never had IBS, all of a sudden, they had a highly stressful job. Um, They were just promoted to CEO of I don't know what. We had young women and men that were just promoted or are in college, college students. So mainly around the age of 20 to thir- um, uh, 18 to 40, that age group have a mm-hmm. lot of IBS. Like almost everyone will come in. They have and great looking people, healthy, young, vibrant. And then when we got to the nitty gritty, not just, not just like, just by talking to them. So what do you do for a living? You know, we were just waiting for an IV or whatever, or I'm mm-hmm. putting an IV and I want to just ask questions and they would tell me, I feel like I will start putting one and two together. The mind, especially that we have a nerve that is called the vagus nerve. The mm-hmm. vagus nerve is connected to your stomach and that nerve plus your, your mind together. If it's overworking, if it's stressed out, and it has a lot of anxiety, it overworks your stomach too and your colon. So you see how it starts getting, and then when, if you have a lot of acid reflux, for example, because you have stress and you have a lot of acid reflux, okay, you take a Pepsid or a Zantac, whatever, fine, if you do. But most of the times people don't even remember to take the medication, especially if you're young. You take it sometimes, you take it most of the times. If it's really bothering you, you take it, but then tomorrow you don't take it, whatever. Let's think about this. 
So you have acid reflux. Do you think it stays just as acid reflux? No. If you keep having acid coming up, coming up, it's going to come to your teeth. If you have It erodes teeth, your teeth, right? Okay. It erodes your teeth, right? Bad breath, right? Fucked up teeth. Okay. Given. All right. That's only the tip of the iceberg. A lot of acid reflux in your stomach, the lining of your esophagus is supposed to be like the lining on the side of your mouth, just like the side of your mouth, right? Uh -huh. That acid reflux destroys that lining. If When you get it destroyed, that ca causes cancer of your throat, cancer of the esophagus, cancer of the stomach. You see how one thing leads to the other? It wow. all started with your brain sending signals, your basal, your vagus nerve saying, I'm stressed out. I'm stressed out. I'm stressed out. I got to You're on flight response, flight response. You know, the flight or flight. Remember that thing that they talk, uh -huh. showed us in uh -huh. school, I think in middle school. Yeah. So that would affect that. If you have cancer, then what happens? Right. <laughs> Hello. So, nice. but one thing always affects the other. I'm going to give you an, another example before we move on. Um, so if you don't have a lot of peristalsis in your, um, and that's a lot of movement, movement, just movement in your, in your, um, colon, because you're too uh -huh. stressed out, you're too fucking busy to exercise and move your ass. And then for a living, you are maybe a, a bus driver or a teacher, someone who sits a long time. Um, give me someone else that sits a lot. I'm not sure. Um, a secretary, right? You sit all day, yeah. but you're on the phone, whatever. So, because you're so stressed out from your job and you didn't move, you, you just stressed out, you're sitting, 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 right? Okay. So then you find yourself not moving your bowels like you usually do, or it's hard for you. Either you're constipated because of that, which you don't mm -hmm. know, and you're not drinking water as often because you're so busy that you don't even think that you need to drink that much water. So you're not moving your bowels. What happens is that you become constipated, right? Then the constipation leads to hemorrhoids. Then uh -huh. the hemorrhoids leads to, you know, the next thing. And then the next, you understand? So, and not only do you get overweight, but you get stomach aches, then the ache. And then one thing, one thing always affects the next system because there's no system in your body that is not connected. And that's, and that's why it's important. Yeah. I wanted to touch on that um, before before I got divorced. Um, I was constantly in that fight or flight, and I was in a very stressful job in finance. Um, I was actually really, you know, overweight, and um, I remember feeling this constant like like something in the pit of my stomach. Tuve como esa esa inquietud, ajá. Entonces, um, and then because of the relationship that I was in, it was like constantly go 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 like something's going on something's going on mm -hmm. always waiting for the other shoe to drop when i finally left that relationship my body responded i was even having pain in my body mm -hmm. like constant back pain things mm -hmm. like that and when i finally left that relationship that i was able to breathe and bring it back in and i and i was doing a lot of things like I went back to school to get my master's to become a teacher. I did all these things. My son had just gotten diagnosed. But the amount of stress went down so significantly that a lot of the things that I was suffering from, I was no longer suffering from. Right. So it's incredible. Because it's everything really incredible. is connected. And and with that being said, I'm going to piggyback on what you said. I'm going to share my personal story because I wouldn't be me if I don't do that. So, um, myself, when I was going through the divorce, you know, before you, before a major breakup, you just don't break up. Um, there, it takes time, right? Yeah. It, there's like the separation, the mental separation, then the physical separation. And then we were living in the same house separation. We had a home. So there was bienes that needed to be separated you just don't it doesn't happen overnight so mm -hmm. all of that plus we had children and a life um together it was taking a toll on me emotionally because even though it was the right thing for us to do it's it's still painful it's very painful and it's life altering 
especially when you feel that your your children's lives also is going to be altered. Um, so at the time, mentally, I was very distressed over that. And um, if I show you pictures of what I looked like, I looked literally, I was 98 pounds and I'm 140 now. Oh my so God. when I see the pictures, people be like, oh, you look so cute. But, I, but people don't know that Internally. to me, I looked like I had a cancer because it was a cancer. It was eating me. And I was eating. It's just that it was eating me up li- alive. So literally, like if you see a picture, when I show you a picture, you would be like, shit, you look so different. And the glow is different. To me, I look gray. I did not glow. I looked gray. Uh, Even though I had makeup and I was pretty, I wasn't ever not pretty. But it wasn't healthy. And I was not in a diet. It was just that my body couldn't, like, I there's people that gain the weight and I was just shedding it left and right that it was, it was so unhealthy. Nada mm-hmm. me servía. So, and slept all day and slept all day and didn't have the energy or the will. If you might say, um, I even had to get on medication for antidepressants and anti-anxiety. Wow. For like two years, I did that Um, because it was just a lot to handle at the time. And my body was just shutting down on me. Like the depression and the anxiety that I had was incredible. And for sure, I could, like you said, pain. That's how I used to feel pain, but I couldn't, I couldn't, um, I couldn't even tell you where the pain was. It's just pain. Like just not only heartbreak, but pain in your body, physical pain. Um, So I know that's true. And that's another thing. Like there's a lot of people that patients that will come in and they're like, you know, they have, they have a name for it. um, Unexplainable pain. And, and even if you listen to your mom, maybe not, I don't know your mom, but I'm just, just giving you an example. Like I remember when I was growing up listening to certain aunts or moms or whatever, say, um, me duele todo. Me duele esto, me duele aquello, me duele espalda, no puedo ni para. Tenían días que no se pueden ni que nada más te decían eso. Pero when they really, when you really ask them, where's the pain? Can you can you give me um you know a description of your pain? Is it sharp? Is it this? They wouldn't be able to tell you because mm-hmm. they it wasn't pain pain like that. It was more like depression. Depression. Mm-hmm makes your body, your whole body affects all of your systems, all of uh-huh. it, not only mentally, physically, and every organ, you don't, you don't, you don't even go to the bathroom like you should. Uh-huh. You don't eat like you should, either you overeat or you don't eat or you don't drink water, all those things. And of course it's going to affect you. Uh-huh. I agree. Oh man, I'm just I'm just glad that we're in a spot that we are better and we are prioritizing ourselves, you know, mm-hmm. above other things. Um, you know, taking mental health days is I feel like that's important as well. People don't really talk about it. Um, what was I gonna say? Oh, okay. So this is this is a, a controversial thing. What would you say to people that call you selfish? Oh, I get that a lot. Um, I, nowadays, I hardly hear it that much. I hardly hear that. But I used to hear that a lot. Um, I'm not going to say from who, but I, I've heard it a lot. And I used to believe it. And um, there was a time that I will say that I will say to people, Oh, I'm selfish. And, um, I'm not a good mom because, um, I'm selfish. Cause I used to hear that a lot. And, um, 
I took time to do work on myself. And I, one time I, I, I took like a week of looking at myself in the mirror and calling myself selfish a lot to the point that I would cry and be crying and crying and be very upset about it and just cry. And then they, it came a day in that week. I don't remember when the third day or the fourth day that I was saying it to myself. And then it had no power anymore. I started laughing uh-huh. and smiling. And I called myself selfish. And I'm like, yeah, you fucking selfish. Yeah, bitch, you fucking so. It just took the whole power away from it. Now, if you want to call me selfish, you go ahead. Call me selfish. I am everything that you think I am. And more. Because I have more stuff for that. That I know that I am. But I'm everything that you think I am because you know what? What you think I am is coming from you. Your perceptions, what you think of the world, what you think of other women, what you think about yourself. And it's your your situation that you need to deal with. So I'm all good. I'm not going to change your lens or your glasses. None of that. I already changed mine. It has no power over me. And I know what I'm doing. And, and, and when I don't know what I'm doing, I go back to the drawing table and I know how to ask for forgiveness. I know how to say that I'm sorry that I made a mistake or whatever to my kids. And uh-huh. I know how to rectify. So, and we have communication here. So you might feel that I'm selfish because I'm not telling you the whole story, but my kids know the story. When we okay. sit here on the table and we're talking about whatever, like my kids know, I'll tell them. Next week, I'm going to Atlanta. I'm going to work here and there and there. We're going to get ready for this. We're doing that. We're doing this. And when I say we, it's me. I'm the one that's flying to Atlanta. But my kids Mm -hmm. feel like they're all part of it. I'm not doing this alone. And they know that. So I'm not selfish. I'm not selfish. I'm selfless, actually. I give a lot of myself to the people around me. And... I take care of myself. And if you want to say that I'm selfish for that, go ahead. Call it whatever. I, I read the dictionary. I know what that means. I'm good. <laughs> oh, I, a lot of people would criticize. Like, for example, comadre, they would invite me to, like, these events. And they're like, oh, why didn't you bring your son? I was like, if I bring my son, it's not going to, I'm not going to be able to enjoy no. mm-hmm. the event. Mm -hmm. like I I'm like no it's not that there's things that I do with my kid and there's things that I do for myself right and if I really want to have a good time and enjoy myself I don't bring my son around because there's things there's time there's a time and place for everything and when I'm trying to be Marcy the woman Mm -hmm. there there I being a mom shouldn't be something like como te digo like it shouldn't be something that I'm hindering myself because I have to be a mom right. and I can't let go and like compartmentalize things. So yeah, I've, I've, I've been some people like um, who shout. And Marcy, let me ask happen. you a question: Is mm-hmm. it even fair for your Aiden to go to somewhere that he's gonna be um, uncomfortable. triggered or uncomfortable? Or behaving a certain way because maybe that's who he is. Who knows? And um, and then, you know, it kind of disrupts the situation or wherever you are. Is it fair for him? Because you already know he, he, he has an issue or you know that he's one and he's going to be walking a lot, right? Like when they're toddlers mm-hmm. and going up and down the stairs of someplace. You know this, but you brought him. Mm-hmm. Is it fair for him that doesn't know, but it's you the one that know, you still bring him and then you're going to be upset or like taking him away from things or taking things from his hand. Is it fair for him? That's definitely not fair. So that's the thing that people don't see. Like there's certain choices that we make as mothers. Um, I call those executive decisions. There's decisions that we make that is for the be- the benefit of our children. And we know our children better than anybody else. Mm-hmm. Like, there's a lot of people that they want to give you, they want to give you shit. Like they're like, oh, like, okay, eh, tú no debería de, 
No, yo conozco a mi muchacho. I know my kid. I'll give you, you know an example about that. About even about people asking you questions with the intention of um, kind of looking down at you for your decisions. I was asked, um, do you miss your daughter when she left to college? And I was like, to be honest, it just, it caught me by surprise. I would have thought of the answer, especially who, mm -hmm. who I was answering to. I should have stopped and like, know how I was going to answer that. But I just answered and it was obvious that the other person didn't receive it too well. <laughs> Because I said, um, no, I don't miss her. I didn't miss her. And she was like, what? Like her face was, it changed the whole thing. And she was like, okay. But in a judgmental way. Of course. Um, and I had to retract and explain myself. I was like, well, it's not that I don't miss my daughter physically. It's just that I... Before she went away um, to college, I picked up hobbies. I picked up a hobby, which was um, whatever it was, right? I'm going to tell you what, what is going to go even crazier now. It was pole dancing. I picked up a hobby. Okay. So I picked up a hobby and then I was, I was asked to be part of a, the podcast also. So I had two mm -hmm. hobbies and I reupholster stuff in the house all the time. I buy I vintage furniture. I paint, like I, I do stuff, right? So I had done, I was doing all those things to, because I'm not just a mother, right? And although I miss my, I, not that I miss my daughter, although my daughter was leaving, I knew that all I did was just not being her mother. I also was a person with interests. So I was busy doing those things. And then, um, so when she left, it wasn't, my nest was not empty. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it makes any sense. It wasn't empty. No, I know what you're saying. And I do you... miss her in the sense that um, I know that she's not here, but I talked to her. And we FaceTime and we text and we share memes and she comes over the weekend. So I did not cry. And people were asking me that too. Like, oh my God, it's going to be so sad. I didn't cry. I just dropped her off. I was excited for her. She was going to do what I didn't do. She was going to leave and be independent and um, study not in the house and not listening um as listening to mom telling her mira ven a recoger el cuarto o vete a lavar vete a fregar none of that like she's studying mm -hmm. she's not here she's over there doing her thing she's independent and i'm watching her soar i'm watching her fly that is dope like and she's yes. right there like she is a phone call away no i i don't even think she misses me I was going to say that I want to piggyback off what you said is that you and your daughter have this beautiful, I love seeing how you guys are together. And yes, you don't miss her physically because I feel like the closeness you guys have, mm -hmm. even though she's not physically there, you you're said still, it. she's still present. You said it. You see, I didn't, that, that part, I didn't realize you nailed it. You actually nailed it because. I wouldn't, I, I wasn't able to, to decipher that. And it's, it's actually what you said. It's that we do, we are close and we have, um, a mother daughter relationship. We we're not friends. She has her friends. Mm -hmm. I have mine. Um, but we do have a closeness and there's trust between us where she knows that she can talk to me and it stays with me. I don't tell my best friend and I don't tell the ladies in the kitchen. No, uh -huh. whatever she tells me stays with me. I don't even call her father unless I really, really have to. And when I do, if I am going to, I let her know I have to tell your father. Yeah. Um, but I'm not, I'm not her friend. I'm her mother, 
but at the same time we know when what to talk to each other about and when to bring each other into a conversation whether it's something that we don't like because I do uh -huh. things that she doesn't like and she will tell me and sometimes because of my upbringing It takes me at back and I want to uh -huh. say something back <laughs> like uh, like what my mother would have told me or uh -huh. like what my uncle would have said. And I have to be like, yo, like she did. a She's you know, that that means I did a good job and that she's she's good because she's actually having that conversation with me yes. and not having it with her friend bad mouthing me or uh -huh. whatever. Like she's sitting down. And letting me know how she feels or how I made her feel or what triggers came up when I said this, that, and the other. And that's something uh -huh. that I taught her. So I can't say anything that means that I taught her well. Just the same uh -huh. thing with my son. I called them on Monday. I had a business opportunity for him. He's 23. And the day before we had spent time together and we were talking about finances, whatever, and talking to him about, you know, what is, what is he doing? Like what's, what's going on with the money, blah, blah, blah. And he says to me, Oh, you know, I just need more. He always needs more money, but you know, 23, he always needs more uh -huh. money, but he's not like making the effort of making more money anyway. So uh -huh. he says to me, Yeah, whatever. So on Monday, I had a business opportunity and I called him and I said, um, you have a few minutes. Let me just explain to you. Um, it's really easy. All you got to do is just take this out of my car. I have some product in my car and you take it out for me and, to the, and we put it in a storage and my boss is going to pay you. I have some, some product that I had to deliver to a, a war a warehouse because we had mm -hmm. we had like a festival last week in New York City and there was a mm -hmm. lot of product left over product as in um liquor. So I yeah. tell him, babe, all you gotta do is just take it out. I could find like a lot of people that do it, but I'm thinking of him. Yeah. So I'm like, you know, let me just call him. He said he needed money, so let me do this. And he goes to me, I'm not in the space right now. I'm not in the space of doing that mentally. I'm not in the space. I just came out of work and um, I'm chilling. I'm relaxing. I want to actually take a shower. I want to drink my tea and I want to smoke some trees. So I'm not in the space for that. And I was huh. like, okay, I, 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 you know what? I respect that. That's cool. I was like, I kind of wanted to say, motherfucker. Like, I pay your cell phone. What do you mean you're not in the space for it? And this and that and the other. Que space ni space ni que ocho na. Dosa cosa que we learn. But I was like, he is speaking my language. There's boundaries. Uh -huh. And there's the thing of what I think you should do. And there's things of what's better for you. Uh -huh. And I've always taught him that. You have to do what's best for you. Because he struggles with mental health issues. And the reason why he has made it to the age of 23 is because not only therapy, but also because he lives in a household where it's always told to him, you come first. And when you don't, and when you don't feel like you should do something, don't do it. It's a disservice oh. to the next person. I don't want you to do anything and be slamming things or uh -huh. tirando chuipi or upset and having that uh -huh. energy around me. Don't. Even if it's money involved, that let it not be that the intention. Money should never be the intention to move you to do anything. Uh -huh. It's because you want to. I love that. And that's it. So I had to actually talk to myself and be okay with his answer. And respect his answer and be like, all right, babe, no worry. Boom, boom, hang up, call somebody else. The next person was like, I can't believe your son said, said no, blah, blah. I was like, yeah, I believe it. It's the truth. He said no. It's okay. But it's okay, though. It's okay. Uh -huh. It turns out well because you know what? You're doing it. 
you're doing it and you have money, right? Uh-huh. Let's do this. Come on. Let's do it. And that's it. Let it yeah. go. Let it go. And that's something that uh, the French, not, we're not friends, but the relationship that I have with my son also that when he didn't move in with me, um, I didn't cry and I didn't miss him tampoco because uh-huh. we have a relationship uh-huh. where he can call me. I can call him. We go on lunch dates. Um, if I know like there's an ex- an exhibit that he likes, I buy tickets. We do that. But I definitely, not only the good things, especially the bad things, the bad things, I get that phone call. Because with my 23-year-old dealing with mental health issues, uh-huh. he can trust me. And he makes that phone call. And yeah, sometimes it's um, emotionally it's painful. Because uh-huh. as a mom, you don't want your kids to be going through that you wish that it would be you. Uh-huh. You wish that you will, that you will take um, those broken wings and you could exchange them for yours. Yep. Um, so I know that um, those phone calls are difficult, but I'm glad he makes them. That he's yes. able to call me and say, mom, today is not a good day. And that mm-hmm. I'm not freaking out and I'm not blaming him for his issues or whatever or for feeling a certain way or I'm blaming this. Nope. We'll be like, all right, no problem, babe. Let's see. what How you feeling? What's going on? Let, you know, and if I have to make a phone call to a doctor or whatever and I ask him mm-hmm. and, he, and he tells me what level of, you know, situation he's going through and we deal with that. So that's why I'm like, I don't miss them. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> yeah. Um, I love that. The, I, lo- I love the, the point of letting them set their boundaries as well. Yeah. And going back to that question that you asked me about, is it fair to Aiden? Um, I also let him enforce his boundaries. I ask him, mm-hmm. Papi, do you want to do this when it's something that's optional? Mm-hmm. And he'll tell me straight up, no, thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, and they I know. honor that. They know. And I honor that, yo lo dejo tranquilo, because at the end of the day, para que, what is the purpose of having him possibly have a meltdown with regards to something mm-hmm. that I'm making him do mm-hmm. when he told me already okay, okay, that he yeah. did not want to do it. <laughs> y ha pasado, ha pasado. Huh. And, um, you know, dealing with that situation, like, just like thinking in retrospect, that could have all been avoided had I honored, you know, his wishes. Y déjame decirte que my daughter taught me that lesson very well when she was three. When she was three, I dijo a me that she didn't want to wear an angel costume that I had bought her for Halloween. That she wanted to uh-huh. be Buzz Lightyear like her brother. Y yo quería una princesa. Lo que para eso fue que yo uh-huh. parí una hija. So en mi mente, I was like, yo tengo una hija hembra y yo quiero ponerle un, un costume de angelito con los cosos, con los wings y mm-hmm. toda la vaina. And I was like, I want to, you know, I was happy. And I ordered it and I was happy. And she was like, I don't want that. I want to be Buzz Lightyear. Y yo diciéndole que no y que no y que no. So guess what happened, girl, for Halloween con ese costume. Me lo tuve que comer yo. Esa niña, si ella se paró del piso, mm, Ella no se paraba con el costume puesto. No oh quería ir God. trick or treating. Salirse del carro fue un show. Todo fue, mira, esa foto quedaron así mismo como ella estaba. Oíste, <laughs> así mismo. Mind you, that week when her brother let go of the costume, ella se lo puso en la semana. Ella estaba para arriba y para abajo, so happy with her costume. <laughs> y yo le tiré foto con el costume del hermano. Y ella estaba feliz. And I was like, if I would have bought her the freaking costume, como ella me dijo, we would have not been going through all of that. It's unnecessary. Claro. It's so, uh, she and taught it's a learning me, experience for you. She taught me that lesson. And from there on, first of all, Kylie taught me a lot of lessons. <laughs> <laughs> I used to write a lot. I used to keep a journal just about her because, you know, yo la iba a matar. Oh, my God. Yeah, because she used to be like, I don't want to wear that. And it was so different from my son. Um, I would take out clothes for him and he'd be like, okay. You know, I buy him clothes. Wait. You just go to children's place, buy clothes, right? Gap, whatever. Never an issue. Se ponía la ropa. Boys are easier with that oh stuff. Oh my God. 
Kylie used to be like, um, I'm not wearing that. I want to wear my boots in the summer. And I used to be like, but it's summertime. Esto no va con eso, o lo que sea. And she was like three. And she used to be like, I want to wear my boots. And you know what? Fuck it. Wear your fucking boots. Isaliano para la calle. Wear your boots. I don't care. Wear your boots. I don't care. Um, for Halloween now, uh, I was like, Aiden, do you want to go trick or treating? This is our tradition. Like, we go to Jersey. My mom lives in the suburbs. And um, I dress him up and we go out. I put on a costume también. You know, I'm on trick or treating. They go, Yo, papi, do you want to go trick or treating? He's like, No, thanks, mom. And I was like, cool, do you want to wear your costume? He's like, yes, mommy. So he put on his little skeleton costume. He let me take pictures of him outside. And that's it. And that's, that's it. all he wanted. He don't know what force. No. Because at the end of the day, what, what, what do we gain with that? Que? But no. nada. Que? Y eso es like... cosa que uno aprendió. De que, que dirán, eh? Ay, que después fulano va a ver que yo no lo llevé trick or treating. Que si yo que. Listen, it is what. But okay, I told you. My daughter's 18 now. And she taught me the greatest lesson. When she was three years old, she taught me that she has a personality, that she has a say, that there are such things as options. And I had to go and read because back then there was no, I didn't have, no, there wasn't any Google or anything. No, we didn't have Google. No. So I used to get Parents Magazine and I used to read all the time on, because I didn't have to read that for my son, for the oldest. So with Mm -hmm. her, I had to read like, behavior um you know when they want to do something you have to distract them or rewarding or this like i had to do all of that although she was a very um uh nah, she wasn't behind in anything she was very smart and she wasn't spoiled she was doing normal things normal things that triggered me because of me growing up, they were not allowed for me to do. So mm-hmm. I knew that they were normal, but I was being triggered as a mom. Like, I, especially when I used to hear even family members, esa muchacha hace lo que ella quiera, tú la dejas hacer lo que ella quiera, tú vas a ver, et da, 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 y yo fuera a mí y le, y le di, ahora me mito, le doy coño que no sigue esto con lo otro, le doy que no jode más, and I didn't have to hit Kylie. And I could go, I had three kids. And when I'm telling you, mm-hmm. just like when you, were you listening right now? Así mismo se oía siempre en mi casa. You mm-hmm. never heard them. Se portaban bien. Yo iba con ellos para todos los lados. No se portaban mal. They used to listen. But that took a lot of self-discipline from my part. Of mm-hmm. A lot of reading and all of that. And also understanding them as people. And giving them options and all of that. And that shit was hard. <laughs> yeah, because we weren't raised like no, that. No, no. ¿Tú te acuerdas? ¿Qué? De que, que, que tú, que... Mira, muchacha. Es, los muchachos no hablan. Oh, no, los muchachos no hablan. Se ven y no se, no se, no se escuchan. Mm-hmm. Which is very... It's like invalidating your voice. Mm-hmm. Pero, comadre, this is... Um, this has been amazing conversation. Sí. We're um, like talking, talking, right? Like in la sala, yeah. hablando disparate. <laughs> sí. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I, I admire you, the way you balance everything. Um, Thank you. You are a phenomenal mother. You are a phenomenal so are you, woman. Babe. So are you. And career person. Um, so we're going to start signing off. Uh, follow me at Comadreando Pod. And follow Sandy on her IG for her podcast. Sandy, can you drop the handle? So the podcast, uh, the Instagram for my podcast is the Art of Happy Her podcast. And it's happy, H-A-P-P-I-H-E-R, Happy Her podcast, the Art of Happy Her awesome Mm -hmm. all right and of course if you have any questions please feel free to send me a comadregram on ig um you can also send me emails at comadrando at yesseethenetwork.com um and thank you for spending time with your comadres bye guys see you soon (laughs) (laughs) i can't wait i can't wait yeah
All right. Thank you so much, Nandi. I love hey, you. Babe. Love you too. Bye. Bye, babe. So you...